So we're at Fuse 2025 in Dublin. I'm here with Rob Sony. He is the chairman of TIP, but also the VP of RAND Technology at AT&T. We're going to focus a little bit on a AT&T now. Um, so Rob, can you just give us a, a, a very quick update on AT&T's uh, open RAN rollout progress? Because everybody is always interested in, in, in where you are and what you're doing with that. Very good, very good. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you again for having me here to talk about and share our progress. Um, it's been a great journey uh, over the last 18 months or so since we signed our uh, landmark deal with Ericsson uh, to modernize and refresh our network. Uh, it's had a already a pretty dramatic impact overall on user experience in the network itself as we also acquired significant spectrum from EchoStar in the last few weeks, which we've actually started to light up uh, in a pretty dramatic fashion. In fact, our goal is to have most of it lit up by Thanksgiving. So wow. already seeing uh, impact on Ookla results, uh, on speed testing, uh, dramatic impacts actually overall uh, in the network, um, putting us in a position we think to win uh, overall in North America to continue to gain new subs. Uh, the reason we did the deal fundamentally was to grow out our uh, capabilities to support 5G SA services and to modernize and refresh and build out um, largely mid, uh, mid-band TDD uh, frequencies and implement essentially very high capacity layer for our subs, for our users. And we've been able to already see the value of being able to do that. And we've moved quite rapidly to do that and dramatically increased user experiences in the network throughout. Um, it's a watershed kind of thing for us as a company, and we continue to look forward to the progress that we expect to see over the next two or three years as we continue to build out uh, the most aggressive build out of any North American operators. And we're not slowing down. Uh, I know the other guys talk about what they don't do, but we are not slowing down. Um, the simple thing is there's an aggressive push to continue to modernize and to refresh, but also fundamentally. Uh, introduce open and open capabilities. And so we have a lot of really good progress overall to report on that. Uh, it's public, actually, what we've done. Um, this is not, uh, for me, I, I'm not a huge fan of PR about lab. It's about when you're in the field and when you're running commercial traffic. Yeah. So today I can tell you confidently we are running commercial traffic on our Cloud RAN instance from Ericsson. We're running commercial traffic from our uh, third-party radios from Fujitsu interfacing with the Cl- Ericsson baseband. And we now have a cloud-based open network management platform uh, that allows us to run third-party applications, already running one in particular from our partners at HCL, uh, running specifically in the network. It was something we had before running. So overall, we, we, I use that word three times, so I hate to say it again, but I would say we're running. Uh, we're very uh, optimistic about our capability at full scale uh, and full capability to carry all the traffic on open capable interfaces. Uh, our target is to be 70% by the end of next year. Right. We're about halfway there. Um, so dramatic progress overall for us as an industry, uh, but also dramatic progress for at and Okay. So what do you say, you might not hear it here at, at, the, at this TIP event, because it's kind of, everybody here is a, a supporter of open and programmable networks, but out there in the in the broader world, there's still a lot of like, you know, skepticism, you might say, oh, what do you think when you hear people say AT&T's deployment isn't really open RAN or, or that open RAN has failed or open RAN is dead? So I, I, I think they're actually, with, with the news of the past week and the significant investments now coming from NVIDIA uh, into this world, I think people need to recognize that AI RAN doesn't exist without open RAN. So our fundamental statements out to our customers Uh, to our stakeholders is that open RAN is the enabler for an AI RAN. Now, does that mean we don't have AI RAN today? Absolutely not. Um, We are today leveraging and using AI in our network for things like energy savings, for outage compensation, for prediction on performance, um, for automation, uh, specifically in how we roll out and deploy. So for us, AI has been table stakes for a while. It's just accelerating, moving more from offline approaches into inline approaches that take more immediate action. We expect those uh, immediate actions to shift from days, hours, to minutes, to seconds as the technology progresses. Um, Obviously, the vendors will drive more of the second level or sub-second level interaction as they introduce new capabilities in their 
uh, stacks and their solutions to support AI and embed AI in that. But my team has also been very deeply involved in creating the framework that allows devices and infrastructure to collaborate tightly on how AI should work. So if you have a model running in a device and a model running in the infrastructure and they're collaborating on performance, we need to have a unified life cycle. We need to have an ability for them to stay in sync so they don't make conflictory decisions. So that framework is going to become very powerful for us now going forward as we see we move to the next level of AI. Uh, as we move past, from my perspective, we're probably in the third generation of AI. We're looking forth for, to the future, the fourth, the fifth, whatever. But it's a continuous disruption model. It's a continuous innovation model, which is different. So I, I, I hate to say it, but I mean, people who think it's a failure or it's dead, I mean, you know, they're always curmudgeons. They're always people who believe what they believe. I, I haven't seen, uh, I think there was a belief that you could implement a network with four or five disruptors at the same time um, in the same domain. So four or five different baseband providers, four or five different radio providers, four or five different cloud providers, four or five different network management providers, all simultaneously and expect that to succeed. Well, that end tuple problem of testing and running and executing seems to me like it would be really, really hard to actually complete it. So yeah, the blueprint we have is pick a blueprint solution a set of operators and then scale outwards, continuously add operators. So yes, we started with Ericsson. Yes, we started with Dell. Yes, we started with Intel. Yes, we started with traditional um, baseband from Ericsson. We'd be bringing third-party partners in, um, some of which are announced, some of which are unannounced. Um, HCL I mentioned, Ira is also mentioned as a partner. We have a variety of partners out there that are working with us and everybody wants to bring uh, their innovation in through the RAP model because they know it's sustainable. They know if they take it, pick it up and take it to another operator, they can use it and reuse it. And that's powerful. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing overall with what we do on the radio side. Try not to build two AT&T specific solutions on that. Same thing even with the cloud. So yes, we have uh, an infrastructure layer today from uh, Ericsson with CNIS, but at the same time, we're ORAN compliant. If somebody wants to come and look at the interfaces and probe them, um, they're free to do it. In fact, we're going to do some of that and in uh, the Accord Lab in Dallas. They'll, that'll be fully visible. The results will be published, more on the front hall at least initially, and then eventually, hopefully, to O1, to O2, and to R1. Okay. So from, from your perspective then, do you think that uh, other operators looking and watching what AT&T is doing, that what you're doing is replicable elsewhere, even in for smaller operators in different markets with a, a different history and a different background? Yeah, I mean, I think they can talk to the guys up in Canada, up north and us, and we talk to them regularly. I mean, they're pivoting from, uh, it's public. I mean, I don't want to talk about other company plans, other operator plans too much, but it's very public. They made the pivot from Huawei to Samsung into an ORAN-based solution. You heard Sushil talk about it this morning yeah. on the panel. Um, so it's no secret of what they're doing. They're doing it largely with Samsung and with uh, HPE, I believe, and with Wind River. Uh, and they're looking to bring in radio innovation from a variety of partners. Yeah. So they're, uh, to some degree, they're not very different from us with a different set of vendors. So um, we have a lot to talk about, lots in common. So there are others that are now starting to follow this path and will start to move in this direction. Um, I, I don't think it, it's easy to do the end temple thing. And I think there was a belief that that's how you were just going to flip the switch and we would immediately be in that complete, almost um, five ring circus uh, immediately. It's, it's not easy to do that, especially for a, I like to say brownstone, somehow <laughs> brown field doesn't feel good, but a brownstone operator. Okay. Um, and then you, you, you talked earlier on about uh, AI and, and AI RAN and how open RAN is, is uh, the starting point for you to be able to think about that, <clears throat> that the, um, the proposition as put forward by the AI RAN Alliance sort of kind of has three pillars. Uh, and one of them is uh, focused on the compute capability that could sit at the RAN. What's your views on the applicability of, of GPU technology in the RAN? Is this something that AT&T is looking at? Is it something for the future? You know, or is it something for now that maybe you're trialing or, and, and testing out? 
Um, I think admittedly, it's still a future topic. I mean, I have had my own personal involvement in this topic from my previous roles at, at Nokia um, and at VMware. It's been a future topic for a while, uh, which you always worry about when something is stuck in the future for too long, and then it gets positioned for the next generation. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's great for the industry that NVIDIA decided to make this relatively large investment in effectively open RAN. Um, they didn't say that, they said it was AI RAN. But I think this actually buoys the industry overall. Uh, GPO to cell site, power price performance is going to be a common theme that you hear from a lot of operators. Uh, really, yes. can we get to the capacity we need um, in the time that we need it uh, with the software? Because the software development cycles typically are long. I mean, hopefully the benefit of moving to a GPU would be that you would shorten some of those cycles and simplify them. Um, but yeah, there are still lots of challenges ahead. I think uh, GPUs at a cell site, obviously that form factor is going to be really, really important. When you move to a centralized location and you start thinking about that and that location, I think it depends on the operator uh, where you are. And, you know, we are, we have limited centralization in our network um, today. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, our population distribution is quite different than, say, Japan. So right. trying yeah. to get to an ability to s highly centralize outside of some key areas like New York City or San Francisco or uh, even Chicago within the centralized areas is not something that we have everywhere in the network. But there will be opportunities to centralize. Um, do they have a play there? I think it remains to be seen. Um, there is a lot of work to be done to actually uh, build solutions that are truly commercial. Um, that offer us what we have today in terms of network management, uh, ability to orchestrate and manage and support lifecycle, but also to achieve the kind of performance that our customers expect in terms of throughput and drop call behavior and mobility experience. So, you know, it, it, they're on their journey. Um, are we part of that journey? I think so. Uh, will we be more active in the journey? Can't tell yet. Right. So watching brief, basically, but uh, yeah. There's lots of things that could happen in the future, but you know, it'll in a year's time, things are moving so quickly, right? Then in a year's time, so many things could be different. So exactly, it'll be interesting to have this conversation a year from now. Absolutely. Right? Well, I look forward to wherever this event <laughs> is next year. Um, we look forward to it. Rob, thanks so much for joining yeah, us. Really, you, appreciate really appreciate it. it. Thank you. Yeah, take care.